Now let's go to Darfur. If you notice, on the mall, 95% of those who were present were Caucasian. I'm not going to denigrate their sensitivity to suffering. But the reason that blacks were not there is because the blacks who could make something happen were never invited. It's not that black people don't care about Darfur, but Darfur on the scale of suffering in the world pales because now I heard there were 180,000 dead from that to 400,000, okay? Two million displaced. But in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, three and a half million have died. No talk. Mm. Uh huh. In northern Uganda, with the Lord's Resistance Army and the walking at night for the children trying to run away so that they would not be kidnapped and made to fight against the government in Kampala. No talk. Why Sudan? For the last 15 years, Sudan has been on the agenda for regime change. Regime change because Sudan uh, housed Palestinian resistance fighters. Uh, Sudan housed Osama bin Laden and put him out. But Sudan is an Islamist regime that is against the state of Israel. Now let's stop there for a moment. See? Now they said, well, these are some Arabs in the Sudan enslaving Africans. So naturally, this is the language of Arabs enslaving Africans. <laughs> this is so clever. And the media pushes that so that there would come a natural hatred of blacks for Arabs so that Arabs look like the real culprits here. Well, you don't know this, but... I and my national, uh, 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 international representative, Akbar Mohammed, who's in the studio with me, who I want to speak on this in just a few moments, he and I were together on a peace mission. Listen to me carefully now. How many years ago was that, Brother Akbar? Over 10 years ago, wasn't it? It was uh, 1994. 1994, 12 years ago. Now, I went to Ghana and spoke with then President Jerry John Rollins. And, and Rollins said, if you want to help ease the crisis, get in touch with Kenneth Kaunda, the former president of Zambia. We got in touch with Kenneth Kaunda, and he said he would accompany us. And so we went to Kenya and met with President Arap Moy, who at that time was over that group of nations that were working because. for peace. What is it? Egad. Egad, E-G-A-D. So when we met with President Moy, he sent us to Uganda, where we met with President Museveni. But the most important meeting was a meeting with Brother John Garang, who for 20 years was fighting the government in Khartoum. Now, why was there a fight? Was it over slavery? Akbar, you were with me. At no time during our talk with John Garang, which was four hours in length, was there ever a mention of slavery. That's right, never mentioned. But they, when I mentioned the word justice, then John Garang's wife broke down and cried and said that I was the only person who came that talked about justice. Now, what was the injustice? The Arabs have mixed their blood with the Africans that live in the north, they are Arabized and Islamic. And the same racist poison that has poisoned the bloodstream of Islam has made the Arab north feel superior to the Christian animist African south. The south is black, 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 so black black till there's blue in their color. So when you have, like the 
enemy has done to us. Mm -hmm. When you're lighter, you think you're better than your black brother or sister. And in New Orleans, when I just left there, they told me about the brown bag, that if you walked in a place and you couldn't pass the brown bag test, meaning your color was darker than the bag that you carry your liquor in, you couldn't go in certain places. And in Washington, D.C., y'all know that there was an elitist attitude among mm -hmm. light-skinned black people against dark-skinned black people. The same game that the enemy has played here and in Africa. Now he's dominating that scene now in Sudan. Now look at the Sudan. It's the largest landmass country, I think. That's right. On the African continent. If it were fully uh, developed, it could feed all of Africa. In the South, there is an abundance of oil. And if you remember in Nigeria, in the eastern part of Nigeria, they wanted to break that part off years ago and call it Biafra. And it, it, and it ignited a civil war. And the civil war was to unite that which kept, gave them power because there was a regime in Lagos that the government of America and Britain did not like. Now what you got in the West, Brother Akbar, tell the audience, because I sent Brother Akbar there to look into the situation in Darfur, and, and James M. Toomey went himself. Tell them about the Janjaweed, tell them about the government, tell them about the farmers, tell them about the herders, tell them what is really happening on the ground there, and then we'll come back to why no black people were there on that mall. Yes, Brother Minister, with your permission, first, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to say to the audience, you know, we have a saying, when there's darkness, stand still. And most black people in America did not participate because the cloud that was around it that they really didn't understand. And then they were not invited in mass. They tried to get some to come. So the standing still is because they've heard so many different things. One of the things I want to start off where the minister left off at when that peace accord was signed in the South, immediately uh, uh, this conflict broke out in the West. Now, until the last five days, most people in America knew nothing about the rebel group. That started all of this. Uh, uh, they had a peace accord in Ab Abuja. The Sudanese government said that they would sign. The rebels first resisted. Bush sent uh, the deputy secretary of state there to force the rebels. Now, how could you force the rebels to sign unless you got some clout with them or were you supplying them with money and weapons and so forth and you told them that this is what you have to do at that time? But the tragedy is that um, if you look at the government in Khartoum, now, whenever we look at the world and you talk about a government, uh, Brother Minister, if you talked about uh, Iraq during the time of Saddam Hussein, they'd show his picture. If you talked about Syria, they would show uh, uh, Assad. Uh, they, if you talked about uh, Saudi Arabia today, they would show uh, King Abdullah. If you talk about Egypt, they would show Mubarak. They've talked about the Sudan, but if I asked an audience across this country, what does the president of the Sudan look like? Most people do not know. He just went to Iran to meet with the leader of Iran and very little information showing him in a picture with him because he is as black as Akbar or either blacker. So he doesn't fit the script of the Arab who's killing Africans. Last week, the Washington Post published the five facts about the four. One of them on there that was blaring, and uh, Mtumi, you can bear witness to this, is that all of the people are black. So if you talk about Arabs killing Africans, and tell me you went into a room when you were there. I went into the same room, and the man said, would the Arab tribe leaders stand up that include the ones that are called Janjaweed? And when they stood up, they were all black. He said, now will the African tribe stand up? And they were all black. And so everybody, we looked at each other <laughs> because the, the picture in America is that these white Arabs are killing Africans. He, and the brother said clearly, what makes them the Arabs, they only speak Arabic, and they're herders or you would call nomads, they do herding. What makes them Africans is they speak an African language and Arabic. They're all Muslims, and so they've had this clash for 500 years. This conflict with the rebels exacerbated it because the government did go in and form a militia, and this militia was not to make people suffer in murder and rape, but it was to root out the rebels who had taken shelter among the villages and the people. And this picture is not seen in America. Yeah, that's, a good, that's a good history lesson. Well, and if, I, if I could just finish that point, 
You see, when you see Senator Tom Lantos leading the march on the Sudanese uh, embassy, when you see Elie Wiesel, these are Zionists. These are pro-Israeli Zionists. Why are they leading the march? Do you really think that they have compassion for what is going on in Darfur? See, human suffering is human suffering. Don't tell me you have compassion for the blacks that are suffering in Darfur and you got Palestinians suffering under your nose and you don't care nothing about that? Come on. If there's three a million and a half dying in the Congo, you say nothing about that? The people that are dying in Uganda, you say nothing about that? No. Then what is the motive sitting up under this? This is what black people have to look at. It is that there's oil in the West, gold. there's gold, uranium. there's uranium, and there's a 500-year fight. Like the early plains... You know, if I was a cattle rancher, you know, and you were a sheep herder, and we didn't like uh, the, 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 the uh, sheep herders, and there's a fight between the cattle ranchers, the sheep herders. Then the railroad comes in, and they start taking the land. So all these boys fighting each other in early American history. Mm. This is what's going on in Darfur, and the mistake that the government made but sincere, they saw these herders that were going to fight against the rebels and they armed them. Mm. But then that 500-year-old hatred that's in them took precedence over rooting out the rebels and the massacre began and so forth.